So I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. Um, obviously, it's a Friday evening, so I, I can appreciate that a lot of people have got lots of better things to do than listen to us, but we thank you for coming. Um, we're going to hear from hopefully five um, individuals this evening um, from across Medway's um, voluntary groups. And then after the presentation, we're going to have a short Q&A session. Uh, so my name's Liz. I'm the director of One Big Family. Um, we are a homeless charity um, who've been uh, working in Medway for the last six years. Um, we've got various projects that we're running at the moment. So um, the ones Mars has been, have been involved with over the COVID period was the distribution of food parcels. Um, so we uh, you, we're, we're used as a referral agent, I guess, by social services, um, the DWP, Turning Point, Housing, and various other people. Um, and they request home, um, either food parcels, emergency clothing, toiletries, and also um, home starter packs for people who are newly accommodated. Um, our packs go out, our, our deliveries go out on a Wednesday, Friday and a Sunday. We had hoped that um, as we're coming out of lockdown, this service would be um, not required as much, but um, we're actually seeing an increase at the moment, um, especially for home starter packs, which are quite often requested for um, families who are fleeing domestic violence um, in, uh, from different areas and they're put into temporary accommodation in this area and quite often they've got nothing with them. Um, so we provide things like bedding, towels, kitchenware, toiletries, uh, cleaning parcel, and anything else really. We've got, um, we've got a stock of toys and all sorts of things. So um, for ladies in there and their children who are fleeing domestic violence, um, that's one part of what we do. The other part is we, we run a weekly soup kitchen every Sunday. Um, that's now been running for five years. And we run that at the bottom of Meeting House Lane at 6.30 every Sunday. Um, during, co during COVID, we've had to adapt our service massively. And we've been running a collect and go service and attempting to social distance people. But um, it's been quite a challenge because sometimes we get over 100 people come to visit us and um, trying to keep them socially distanced has been a bit difficult. Um, so yeah, that runs every Sunday that's kind of leveled out a bit now and we, we tend to see sort of 70 people every week there um, people come and get um, hot food obviously which they can take away um, we've had a provision of fresh food from there and also we do a lot of advice and signposting and advocacy um, we work very very closely with um, lots and lots of other agencies within the homeless sector in Medway and um, yeah so the the other project, our main project right now is we're running a temporary supported accommodation, um, which is in Medway. And th this this charity, well, our charity is run entirely by volunteers. We have no paid staff currently. Um, so to take on a, t a supported accommodation project was, was massive for us. Um, we house nine people at any one time and we provide the um, basic wraparound, very intensive support required so that people can gain assistance with um, any issues that may be the underlying causes of homelessness. So we're, we're always looking for people to assist with that. We've got a beautiful garden there. We would like gardeners as well, if anybody likes gardening. Um, we've got a beautiful garden. We're really lucky. Um, and it is a, it's an amazing project that was kind of gifted to us because due to COVID, we weren't allowed to run our homeless refuge, which we've run for the three years up to this one. Um, we've run a homeless refuge in, in Medway and that provided 3000 beds over three winters to um, rough sleepers in Medway. So yeah, we, we're kind of really, really busy and um, any assistance anybody would like to provide would be greatly appreciated. Um, but if you've got any questions, please feel free to ask. And thanks, Chris, for, for asking me to do this. It's always a good, 
a good uh, opportunity to share out the workload. Yeah. yeah, that'd be good. Barry? How many of your sleepers are there in Medway? Do you know how many of these? Currently? Yeah. Uh, not many, no. And uh, have the council been accommodating them over the uh, lockdown? So during the first part of lockdown, the government um, introduced a scheme called Everyone In. So for the first three months of lockdown, um, every rough sleeper had to be offered accommodation. During, the, during those three months, we were tasked with providing the on-site support in a local hotel for rough sleepers. And we had um, 80 people through that project in three months. Um, so, yeah, the... the they literally did get everyone in. Um, unfortunately, some people choose not to stay, um, yeah. which, you know, um, but, but as a service, we never take our service away, if you know what I mean. We will always, even if somebody, and I'm not going to call it fails, but even if somebody um, is not overly successful, we won't, you know, we continue to support them. So there's not currently that many rough sleepers in Medway, I'm really pleased to say. Um but it's a work in progress, you know, and, and unfortunately, um, I think when the eviction bans are lifted, we're going to see a, a big increase because, yeah, it's just the mm -hmm. way it is. And, and the financial impact of COVID for some people has been has just been devastating. You know, a lot, a lot of the rough sleepers we had um, through the hotel last year were rough sleeping because they, they'd lost their jobs. Um, you know, and, and some of them were in um, what you would call unsafe accommodation insofar as they didn't have proper tenancies, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, if, if you're just yeah. paying a mate an amount of money a week, um, they were just kind of being told, sorry, you can't stay here. And so we're put into unfortunate positions. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's a work in progress. But there are some amazing agencies in Medway. Medway is, is really lucky, actually to have the agencies it's got. I'm not just talking about us, there's loads of us. Um, yeah. Thank you. Do you, does your experience of the Everyone In um, campaign, um, do you think that that could quite easily be ex extended? And although there are some people that wouldn't take up the offer. The, the Everyone In campaign was for Medway, I can only speak for Medway, um, was extremely successful because we because they were provided with support on site the problem in other areas um that we you know people in other areas that we spoke to the scheme didn't work because you were you were throwing people into hotels but they weren't given any support on site um and it was a scary time for everybody you know and all of a sudden you're being asked to stay indoors um but but we worked collaboratively with a lot of a lot of other agencies and we were able to provide food clothing everything anybody needed so they didn't have to go out um, and, it, and it really did work it worked incredibly well in the first three months of lockdown could it work it, I mean it could work in theory permanently but it's it's um it's an expensive solution but the, you know at the end of the day the human beings that we're talking about yeah. so um yeah it, it would be great if it could run permanently Anyone else have any questions? Oh, um, I just wanted to ask, what's your greatest need at the moment for the types of volunteers? You like? um, we'd like, oh, I've got lots of people. Um, gardeners would be great. Um, delivery drivers would be great. Uh, if anybody feels like they would um, like to give a bit of time to help us in the supported accommodation. We've got a couple of quite vulnerable people um, staying with us currently who kind of needed a befriender, you know, just somebody to come and have a chat with, a cup of tea with once a week for a couple of hours, you know, nothing, not not, not the kind of heavy duty supported stuff, just need, they just need um, a friend really. Um, yeah, and all, we're open to all offers. Whatever your skill set is, please get in touch and we may find you a position. Okay, thank you. Julie? Yeah, I was just wondering when you said about the food um, and it's at the meeting house, obviously with um, 
Is that with the Chillingham Street Angels? Are you do you work with them there, or is it different entity? No, the the Gillingham Street Angels have got um, Gillingham Street Angels have got their shop now, which is where they do all their food from. Um, we we do work closely with with Neil and his team, but ours is completely separate on a Sunday. Right. Okay. Steve's Thank got, you very much, then. I don't... Steve's got his hand up. Oh, Steve, go on then. Yeah, it was just a quickie to do with the food deliveries, um, mainly because of the issue I had once uh, when delivering some, partly because it was in flats. Um, but the, the little pieces of paper you give with the details, the phone number and the address, it, it, um, it would be handy if there was a name as well, because with a couple of the ones I was delivering to I wasn't 100% sure I was delivering them to the right person because you sort of you know you get someone that suddenly comes out of the flat and you don't necessarily know because you haven't a name to ask so you hope you're giving it to the right person yeah it's the the only the only issue is it goes all unfortunately it goes down to GDPR and um and all that nonsense excuse me my cat's just decided he would <laughs> like to say hello I do apologize there you are hello George um so yeah, but no, I'll take that on board and thank you, thank you for suggesting it. So we can have their telephone number, but not their name. Yeah. All it is is it's a case of if that piece of paper was to go missing. Yeah. It's a case of that has got some that has got two pieces of personal information on it, which is then clusters under GDPR. Right. Right. Bane of our life, GDPR. Isn't it? <laughs> I had to renew renew our ICO today. It's like, oh, yep, that time again. It is. Well, just to say um, that it is better that we have the phone number because at least that way we can check to see whether they're in rather yep. than driving there and finding that they're not. So uh, yep. that aspect of it um, helped me today with the two that I did. So it's just an ongoing thing. And I know that when you have needed help, Liz, um, we've put messages on our groups and then the volunteers have come forward uh, sometimes so quickly. It's uh, You get inundated with responses. So um, as, as and when you do need something, we can always post a message on the group um, that, that it's relevant to. I only post stuff on the Raynham or the Gillingham group when it's stuff for Raynham or Gillingham. I don't send them the do a specific post if it's only for Strood or Rochester yeah. I'd put that on the appropriate group yeah no that's great and you know thank you for all your help with it Chris because um it's been invaluable to us um over lockdown and you know and and as I say this looks to be continuing um unfortunately yeah and, and also Marilyn's helped us out quite a bit on the peninsula okay. when it's been stuff out in who and grain and so on and so forth. Otherwise, it, it becomes a very long trip. Absolutely, absolutely. No, it's been it's been amazing. And um, I'll get the I'll put the requests on the social media for gardeners, delivery drivers, and I'm sure we can work with you on the befriender side as well through Chilla and her team. So that'd be amazing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wait, sorry, when you mean delivery drivers, are you just talking about the food, delivering the food packages, or you've you got other other things that you need delivered? It's it's the food parcels, but the home starter packs as well. Okay. Um, yeah. Just, um, I'm starting a Hermes delivery route. Okay. Um, next week, so I don't know how many days I'm going to be doing it, but I'm just wondering... While I'm out driving around, <laughs> I might be some use to just nip in somewhere else en route. So I could maybe let you guys know what I get, what I get organised, and then whether I could be of any help while I'm out and about. Great, awesome. Hey, are we going to share the Zoom call with Liz after? I know that Liz has yeah. got to go off to do something else. Yes, once it's way. all. Sorry, that's no, fine. Yes, yeah, so once I once I've edited it all, um, probably Monday I'll send it out to everybody that registered, um, and make sure you've all got it. So if you want to watch back because you've had to shoot out and miss some of it, or just to recap, it's there for you to have a quick look through. Brilliant. Wow. Right, thank you very much, Liz.
floor is yours, Sheila. Thank you very much, um, evening everyone. So I'm going to talk about the Let's Get Chatty service, uh, of which I'm the coordinator. Let's Get Chatty service started um, at the height of the pandemic in March, March last year. It feels like it's been going for a much longer time, but yeah, it's been a good year, been very, very busy. Here you can see a picture of the um, committee, the team, my very helpful, amazing team. Um, wouldn't be able to do the job without them. So um, here they all are. Some Steve's here tonight. Kate's here as well. The others weren't able to make it, but yeah, this is my team. Uh, so the Let's Get Chatty service, yeah, came about as a pandemic. There was one volunteer, one phone, um, but over time it's grown to about 30 volunteers and uh, we've had loads of people coming through our doors. Uh, we've reached about, we estimated around ballpark figure about 80 individuals across Medway. Um, there's many referrals that we do take, but then we can't um, continue with them because the clients become quite complex. So we're always mindful of who we can support. Um, we've been offering telephone support since the very beginning, one-to-ones, and we've kept that going. Um, the number of referral agencies that we've got has grown a lot as well. Uh, so we are able to take referrals um, from different um, people at the time, um, and we're extending that as we go along. Uh, so here I list off some of the agencies that we've forged relationships with, and I've met with another two today, uh, which I will probably add on. So it's growing all the time, and um, I was speaking to somebody in Canterbury today who's also heard about us. So... Um, message is going out quite far now about the work that we're doing, which is great. Um, people are wanting to sort of link in as well because there's not a lot of befriending services out there that are doing what we're doing in the way that we're doing it. So that's good. So um, just to say that we have, um, yeah, we, we're, we're a very well structured group. We have various meetings and we also support other organisations through the various forums that we, we sit on. Uh, so, um, again, that's really great and how we can support each other. So one of the things that we did in September, just before the second and the third lockdown, is we were able to start our coffee chat and connect sessions. Uh, because with all the telephone befriending, it was really people wanting to start to see each other again. And they were very successful. We only managed to do two because of the lockdown. But the ones we did, it was really great for people to see each other, meet, connect. Um, and we've had to halt them for half a year because of lockdown, but we're hoping to continue them next month and start them again. And I know people are very keen to get going with them again. So we do, we do one in Rochester and we've also been doing one in Gillingham as well. <laughs> So people are welcome to attend these if you want to. You don't need to be a member of the Let's Get Chatty service if you just would like to come along and support it or you feel like you, you would like a connection, just let me know and um, I will let you know about the dates and times for the subsequent ones. And on top of that, because we couldn't go into cafes, we decided to organise what's known as walk and talk sessions because as a voluntary group, we were able to have up to about 30 people that we could uh, meet. So um, we've been doing those since the new year and we've been organizing some lovely walks, mainly in Medway, Rochester. We've got one coming up next weekend at Capstone Park. These have been proving popular as well because not only because people can connect, but also the social aspect of being outside and going for walks in nature. I was thinking initially that this would be an interim thing before the cafes open, but because they have been so popular, I'm gonna keep these going. And uh, yeah, and we're getting lots of people who aren't members wanting to join as well. Uh, Medway Council normally refers people to us too. So again, if you're interested in the walk and talks, uh, let me know and I can give you dates and times. So the last uh, uh, scheme that I've been involved in is the Pe International Pen Pal Scheme. This was launched uh, a few months ago. And the idea of this is connecting people internationally. We've had people contacting us through Facebook, through our social media, 
that have been interested in what we've been doing. And we've noticed there's a, a common analogy about the human experience and people just needing support. Um, people are feeling isolated. So I set this up and it was quite successful last month. We had people from other countries that joined and it was great to talk and hear about their experiences. Uh, one of the things we realised, those of us who attended, and I know Julie was there, is um, how grateful we are to be living in the UK compared to some countries which um, haven't got furlough schemes or anything like what we had during lockdown. A lot of them are living in, some of them in refugee camps and things. So it's been great in terms of learning and communicating and having empathy and supporting each other as well. So I've got another one of these events coming up this weekend on Saturday and Michelle, who's here, is gonna be coming to speak to us as well about social isolation. Um, and I'm hoping to build this community, this international community and invite different speakers. I was speaking to someone today and she's saying that university students are interested in getting involved as well. So um, I think it'll be a great initiative going forward. And again, if you're interested, let me know. So we've, we've been very fortunate that we've received funding for this work. We got 4,000 pounds from the testbed fund and that's enabled us to do various things. Due to lockdown, we haven't been able to use the funds in the way that we, we would have liked, but um, here, I won't go through all, through all of it, but you can see some of the things that um, we have been doing with our money and we're hoping that we can start to use it and uh, yeah, maximize the opportunity that we've got through, this, uh, through these uh, initiatives that we're doing. And so, yeah, again, there's various things going on. As you can see, we're quite busy. We're happy to work with any organization that needs support with befriending or they, you feel like you, we, they will benefit by coming to us. And uh, yeah, just do, do get in touch if you're interested. Thank you for listening. I'm happy to take any questions. Well, thank you very much, Sheila. Um, so on top, you've got the um, event tomorrow that you're doing with the International Pen Pals. And then I believe you're doing a walk and talk. Is it next weekend? Yeah, on the 15th, we're doing another walk and talk. Um, if anybody wants to be added to the mailing list and to know about these events, just let me know again. We can post the details. Well, thank you very, very much. So now we're going to go across to Barry. Um, if you're ready to go. I'm all ready to go, thank you. Uh, Lions, Club of Gillingham. We're part of a, a worldwide organisation which uh, are active in 212 countries around the world and we have one point, approximately 1 1.4 million people uh, as members. Uh, in the UK, we have about 12,000 members, over 600 clubs, and Gillingham is the only club in Medway, because unfortunately we had two, but Medway Club closed down 11 years ago. Mm. Uh, our club has 17 members. Unfortunately, out of that 17, we've probably got about 10 who are active. Uh, the others either have disabilities or they're just too old now. Uh, my eldest member is 92. Wow. Uh, two years ago our average age for our club members was 68 and in the UK two years ago the average age of a member was 68 also. So we are an, quite an old organisation if you like uh, and could do with some younger people. Uh, what do we do? Uh, our motto is we serve. So we try to be a service, you know, to anybody who needs it. We do a uh, lot of work with guides, scouts, you know, young people, uh, sick children, families, elderly people. We do eye testing uh, at Special Olympics throughout the world. We help deaf people and disabled people, help blind people or partially blind. Uh, two of the things we do, uh, one of the things we do worldwide is uh, site first, 
where we collect used glasses. I go to uh, Specs, uh, not Specs Savers, Boots and Vision Express in Chatham every couple of months and gets glasses. They get sent to our club in Chichester, who sorts them out, sends them to a club in France, who then grade the glasses. And then they end up in various places in the world being given to people who need them. Uh, two years ago, the Lions, along with Moorfields Hospital, opened a hospital, eye hospital in Ghana, uh, which is it's a teaching hospital as well. So everybody from a lot of African countries go there to train. Uh, but that was help, you know, a, a joint thing between the Lions and uh, Moorfields. Uh, my club itself, uh, one of our members is from Sri Lanka and he started uh, up a thing called Site Sri Lanka where he, he's helped so far in three years, they've operated on 500 people to give them their site back and he goes a couple of times a year. But basically our club, uh, we go out of the funds we raise uh, eight percent is goes to local, and ten percent goes to national, and ten percent goes to abroad. Uh, and that we feel, feel that's a, a reasonable split because and lo it's local people who raise the money, so therefore most of it should go to local people. Uh, I'm more interested in myself and what we do locally, and. Uh, our big problem we got is, as I said, we've only got 17 members. We are in a process of trying to uh, establish a new club on the peninsula. Uh, but until after lockdown finishes, we can't have meetings or uh, information evenings. So this is something we'll be looking forward to doing in, say, hopefully June and July. And if we can get anybody, more people interested in another club, that means Medway will be better supported. Uh, some of the things we actually do locally is that, a bit like Liz was saying, we help people out when they come from broken homes with bedding. Quite often, you can go and see every month we get a request for a washing machine. Uh, and, you know, we do what we can with what little money we have. Because we don't, we don't have a, we don't make a lot of money a year. I could say that possibly average about £10,000 a year, which isn't a lot for what we do. But uh, we're also quite willing to give up our time, you know, uh, helping in projects which don't involve money. It just in involves time. So we'll go out litter picking. Uh, we help, help anything really, any reasonable request will help doing it. If some of my... Uh, members have interest in gardening, I shall ask them to get in touch with Liz and go and help do the gardens there, if they're capable. As I said, you know, our average age is 68, so a lot of us can't bend down <laughs> to do the gardening. That's easy. Um, we have a lot of things, a lot to do with uh, Medway Hostel. We uh, buy presents and donate money so the children can have a Christmas party at Christmas. And in the summer, we uh, donate money so they can have a children's picnic down at Riverside. Uh, it's lovely. And, you know, that is basically, you know, we, we try and help people uh, in difficulty where we can. You know, if we've got the funds and there's a, a need there, we'll try and see if we can uh, help them out. We support the guides. Uh, as I said, we support the scouts mainly uh Gillingham Scouts, but they do help us at Christmas. They help us man our sleigh going around the streets. And if it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be able to do it really because we couldn't get enough people out there who's fit and uh, healthy to be able to walk around. And that's it really. I mean there's a lot more we do but that is uh the base of it. Oh there is one thing we do do is uh we do a thing called message in a bottle. And it's just a little bottle where people can have it who's got medical needs and they fill it, fill the form out and on that form it, you put down what medication you are on 
and all things like that. And you put a sticker in your on your front door, your front window, and any emergency person who comes along, fire, ambulance service, sees that sticker, will know they go in your fridge and there will be your message in a bottle and they can find everything you want. And we're quite happy to give these out to groups who put in a, a request for them. That, and that's it. Yeah, that's really interesting. It's yeah. a fa fantastic scheme. It is, yeah. Uh, some of our other clubs, they do, uh, they do like a teddy bear thing. So if a child goes into hospital, they've got a teddy bear to go with them in the ambulance or come home with them in the ambulance. You know, it's uh, really good. That's lovely. I've been, I'm on the Facebook group, so I've been seeing some of the, what you guys have been up to across the country and it is, it is really awe inspiring. It's very impressive. Yeah, like everybody else, we, we have no, we have no paid people in our organisation. The only paid people in the organisation, there's uh, one person in Birmingham who actually runs the office for the UK. Uh, and then you've obviously got your people in uh, in America who run the in international headquarters. But other than that, nobody in any of the clubs get paid paid for anything. Purely voluntary. And how long have you been in Medway? When did you get established? Uh, oh, 70, 70 years. Uh, wow. No, sorry. The Medway, sorry, the Medway Club, uh, 51 years the Gillingham Club's been going now. And uh, Chris, who you spoke to, who's our president this year, he was one of the original members. Wow. And uh, we've got one other member. I think he joined six months after Chris did. Oh, he missed out on the, on the, the badge and that at the end then. <laughs> yeah. I mean, unfortunately, uh, because of the uh, lockdown, Chris didn't have his 50-year uh, celebration last year. And he's not going to have his issue either. <laughs> oh, no. So he's going to be 50 plus two next year. <laughs> oh, it'll be a big party then. Yeah, that's pretty. I really I want to find out more about the message in a bottom bottle scheme because that's something that because obviously we deal with predominantly older people, so it's something we might be able to help spread on your on your behalf. Help out. Yeah. Anyone have any questions they'd like to ask Barry? Michelle. Yeah, um, I just wanted to say Barry, yeah, we'd be very interested in your message in a bottle. Um, as well so if you can sort of share with Kate how we can get in touch with yeah. you um, and also once you're sort of ready to start meetings in on the peninsula do get in touch because I'd love to be involved um, in helping you with that and promoting that for you. Am I right saying you was on our meeting last month? I was yes. Yeah. I thought you was. <laughs> <laughs> oh this is brilliant. Can, can I just, just say Sorry, I just want to say thank you so much for the Santa sleigh. My children are all grown up now, looked forward to that every year. And now my grandchildren absolutely love it when you come round. Thank you. No, same here. For me, it doesn't start till, till you see the sleigh at Christmas. So yeah. not having it this just, just Christmas just gone, it was really Well, we did. Really sad. We, we, managed, we managed it for nine evenings. Oh, did you? We did. Yeah, and then we past to, nine. Then we had to stop. Yeah, we didn't want to, but we had to because this of Christmas. the COVID restrictions. Yeah, this Christmas it'll all be back on. We always look for the dates and where you're gonna be. Yeah, <laughs> Barry, Barry, it's Chris. I've got a quick question regarding donating glasses. Yes, Chris. Okay, uh, where can we drop them off? You can drop them off at Boots or Vision Express. Okay, no problem. Vision I'll Express in Chatham or Medway. Uh, sorry, or uh, Hempstead. No, no problem. I'll, I'll drop them off at Chatham. Thank you very much. Now, I, what I'll do, because I'm working quite closely along with Marilyn with a few of the eco clubs that are setting up, eco hubs. So I'll let them know as well. Could I please ask you not to include the uh, cases? Just the glasses, no case, please. Just no because, cases. Because uh, I don't think the council would quite like me putting 200 cases in a bag like you know, and disposing of them in the normal rubbish. Uh, when they open it, they think it's trade rubbish and they know we can't take it. Oh, just, no, it'd just be glasses on their own. I mean, tell, tell you how good it is. Uh, um, next week, I'm going down to Chichester, Chichester because uh, Parcel Force used to deliver the parcel free of charge and they stopped that. I'm taking mm. 
about 20 boxes down. And, uh, I mean, for my club alone, I, I mean, I, I myself at home have got 1,400 pairs to take. Uh, Chris, our president, wow. he's got another three boxes, so that's probably about 1,200. And I know uh, on the way I'm going to East Morling, uh, West Morling, where another our club is, I'm picking 1,200 pairs from there. So, you know, there's lots of glasses out there which will only get thrown away, but they yeah. go all around the world. The, the good thing when I mentioned about the... Uh, the hospital in Ghana, uh, some of our glasses, what we what we send over to France, actually ended up being issued out in Ghana. So, you know, it's just fantastic, you know, that mm. there's an end product, you know, you find out where they go. No, it's definitely. And when do, when do you say you're going to Chichester? Me, I'm, go, I'm going next Thursday, but... Next Thursday. I've got, no I got no room in the car for any more. Oh, you haven't got any room? Ah, never mind. <laughs> I was going to put a shout out. If you've got no more space, I won't put a shout out what, on. What we, have, uh, we have zones and there's four clubs in our zone and uh, I'm taking some from each of those clubs. So I won't have any more room in my car. <laughs> uh, fair enough. Fair enough. Well, thank you very much for joining us. Um, and I'll circulate the video afterwards with contact details as well for you and Chris. Thanks for the invite. Brilliant. Um, so I believe we're now going over to Michelle. So, who cares? Um, bit of a play on a name. Um, I think you'll probably guess we support people out on the Who Peninsula. Um, and this very, very strange logo um, is very recognisable to people that live on the peninsula, perhaps, um, but perhaps not so much to people who don't. So this is the actual shape of of the peninsula. So, so who, who are we? Um, so the background on Who Cares is um, a social enterprise company called Derek, um, which stands for Developing and Empowering Resources in the Community, um, actually approached Medway Council back in 2014, because um, they wanted to start a pilot screen, a, um, pilot scheme around social isolation and loneliness and the council thought this was a great idea um, and they agreed on two areas um, the peninsula um, and Waters Lake very different areas the Hoo Peninsula is obviously quite a rural area um, and it's quite easily to become isolated especially in the villages that are further um, onto the peninsula such as Grain, Stoke and All Hallows um, and Waterslope was chosen because of the, the demographics. There's some, some pockets of deprivation there. Um, so there's isolation in that area as well. So the project kicked off in 2014. Um, a lot of public um, open meetings to sort of discuss and form what this organi organization was gonna be. Um, and a board of directors was formed in 2015. We registered as a community interest company in 2015. And we received our um, startup loan from Derek by the big social capital. Um, and we're not a Medway Council Commission service. Um, we're not a Medway Council service, um, but they did um, guarantee our loan from um, Derek. So they do have an interest in us because we have to pay the money back. <laughs> um, so Who Cares opened our doors to the public in July 2016. So when we first started, we was um, a small team. Um, we are, um, we do have paid members of staff. We started with three members of staff. We had a manager who was the overall project manager. Um, we had a volunteer coordinator and we had our life plan coordinator. Um, now the life plan coordinator is the person that would give the support to the people that refer into our services. At the end of 2019, we was lucky to receive, um, to be awarded um, some money from the big um, lottery fund. And this was for an expansion bid. So we've been able to take on um, some other members of staff. Um, and we are now a team of eight members of staff. So we've got four full-time members of staff and four part-time members of staff. 
Um, so we still have our manager, um, myself, I'm the community development officer. When I started, I was the volunteer coordinator, um, but I've now taken on a different role. We've now got two life plan coordinators that support our partners. We've got a special specialist befriender um, who um, befriends people with progressed dementia. We have our volunteer coordinator, we have a volunteer administrator, and we have our lovely receptionist, um, Paul Lane. But although we are eight members of staff, we would not be able to support um, the amount of people we do support across the Who Peninsula without our volunteers. And we're really lucky that we've got 65 active volunteers. Um, this, sometimes we have more, sometimes we have less, um, but at the moment it's around 65 um, active volunteers. Um, the majority of our volunteers are retired. Some are employed. Um, recently we've taken on quite a few, a, a number of volunteers have joined us because they've been furloughed um, and sort of during the pandemic lots of people um, stepped up and wanted to, to volunteer and help. Some are stay-at-home parents um, and some people are unemployed. So what's our objective? Our, our main objective is to prevent and reduce social isolation and loneliness. Um, slight difference there but I, I won't go into that. Um, improve support for vulnerable people. Um, um, and very importantly, improve support for carers um, and the pe people they support. Um, we want to build community connectedness. Um, so just basically helping people connect to each other and other organisations um, and support the communities to reach their potential um, and hopefully employ improve employability prospects in the area. So how does our support work? Well, anyone can refer in to us. Um, but we do re receive referrals from adult social care and other organisations as well. When we receive a referral, our, one of our lo lovely life planners will go out to that person pre-COVID um, and, and basically ask them, you know, what can we do? What, what will make your life better? Um, and from that, we create a person-centred plan. Once the life planners have found out from the person, you know, what their challenges are, what they'd like to achieve, um, that she takes that to the, the volunteer coordinator who will look at our lovely team of volunteers um, and then they match them with a volunteer. Um, and I'll go into some of the things that our volunteers do in a moment. So this is pre-COVID. <laughs> a lot of what we did was um, befriending in the home or the community since COVID. Um, most of that hasn't turned into telephone befriending. We've always done shopping and prescription collections. Again, during COVID, that, that became more of a shop and drop um, for shopping and the same for prescriptions. We provide transport to health appointments and community activities. Um, for anyone who, who, who doesn't live on the peninsula, um, there are quite a few challenges around in the area, uh, one of them being very poor public transport links. So, for someone, especially the elderly, um, it's very difficult for them to access services within the towns. So a, a large majority of what we do is help people get to those essential health appointments um, at the, the community hubs, at the hospital, Maidstone, we've even taken people to London, um, and also accent, accessing other community activities. We do practical activities such as like gardening or dog walking, um, support in the community generally, um, and the admin and fundraising as well. So um, the, the staff do a little bit more um, higher end support. Um, they do help people with housing, they help people with benefit claims, um, PIP assessments. We do a lot of advocacy. Um, we're part, we work with the CCG, the uh, Clinical Commissioning Group as health researchers um, for Medway. Um, we're a member of the Medway NHS Trust um, and we help the hospital. At the moment, we're involved with their um, patient experience strategy. We work with Time to Change, public health, um, social prescribing. So we do actually have a social prescriber um, that works with us as well. We're part of the Medway Champion scheme and we're part of the Medway Champion network, which is slightly different. Um, they're just um, a group of people that are advocate, advocates for, for the area. Okay, 
I think that's me. Any questions? Yeah. Hi, yeah, I just wanted to check if you got the befriender that helps people with dementia. Is it only people in WHO or can we refer people from Medway? No, we're very, very area specific. Um, our support is only for people that live in the ME3 postcode or UPNA because we, we, we consider UPNA to be isolated as well and some parts of Higham actually, which are, is not always actually Medway. Um, so yeah, unfortunately we're very area specific, um, the type of support that we give. Um, and I don't think we'd ever sort of come away from the peninsula because we were set up to support the people of the peninsula, peninsula and their very sort of unique challenges. Um, so yeah, okay. it will always. But we do have um, our sister organisation in Waterslade that covers the ME4 postcode, um, and ME4 and ME5, I believe. Mm. So and you've also got the MVA befriending scheme. Yeah, we're aware of that one. Thank you. So you have a there are, you have a specialist befriending because I noticed it said Waterslade. So you do have still an opera, operative sort of uh, system for Waterslade. So, but um, Waterslade and Lords were together are our sister organisation, um, but we are two completely different organisations, and we was just set up at the same time. And we both received our funding from the same source, but we are two separate organisations. But we we do. We help each other, but we're we're not not the same team as such. No, what well, I was thinking though, if we if we have someone who we feel might is, is complex needs such as dementia and would benefit from a more specialist agency, and mm. they live in Waterslade, would should we come like through you, to, or could you give us the details of the of the, the Waterslade agency to contact as well? And yeah, no, absolutely, we could, yeah. I can give those to Kate, um, yeah. the details of the art of sister organisation, absolutely, yeah. 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 And, and did that bef dementia befriender come to you fully trained or were you able to put them through the training that was required? So um, we actually received funding for, for Mark, our dementia befriender. What, what happened, a lot of what the people we support do have dementia, um, but it became increasingly more difficult for our volunteers to support them as the dementia progressed. Um, so we thought we actually needed specialist peoples to help. Um, so we received funding to employ someone. Mark works 16 hours um, a week um, and he's, has, his background is he's a mental health nurse. Okay. So he comes with, he comes with a, you know, a, a, yeah. a really skill, high skills um, set. And was that through the Derrick scheme as well? Or was that through a, a separate funding tree? Um, that was through a separate funding tree. Um, believe, no, I'm probably wrong. So I'm not going to say that. My manager <laughs> got those details. Um, I want to say awards for all, but I don't think it was. <laughs> no, it's no, no problem at all. I'll have a, have a Google. So we're, we're doing some PTSD training, um, but they're, they're, we, we've got a couple of, of individuals that have got dementia. So we are thinking we need, we're getting in a bit over our heads sort of thing. So we, we want to either pass them on to the right people or get the training that we need to, yeah, just, I mean, to do Kate, them justice. We, we can have a chat. I mean, Mark does do um, a training session for our volunteers um, around dementia. Um, okay. So we can have a chat sort of another time to see if he'd be able to supply that or That'd deliver that to your volunteers. Fantastic. On a, on a practical side, Michelle, sort of pre-COVID, but also because you mentioned like taking people to hospital appointments, how, how does that work in, in the sense of um, how, how many volunteers accompany the, um, um, your client? Pre-COVID pre or? Well, both, in the... really, because it's, it's independent of the COVID situation, I'm thinking, you know, yeah. more like with, with, with taking people to hospital, so to speak. Yeah, so, so um, pre-COVID, we didn't, you know, there wasn't really much of an issue. Um, we, we can't transport anybody that isn't able to um, transfer from a wheelchair to a car. Um, if they're, they're actually not able to transfer, then we have to direct them to sort of G4S or another organisation. Mm. Um, but generally, yeah, it would just be one volunteer um, supporting 
the partner as we call them our clients yeah. um, and if if they needed to be accompanied um, we would accompany them to the appointment as well so it's not just a sort of transport you know we'll drop you off at the at the hospital and we'll pick you up again if they actually need us to take them into the hospital um, and sit with them we, we do that as well a, a lot of our partners are hard of hearing so they often need support at sort of doctor's um, appointments yeah, because yeah. They, they really can't hear yeah, um, yeah. some of the information um, and, and get embarrassed to keep asking so if they've got someone there listening they can sort of tell them another time so really we're, we're, we're small enough that we're not in a box yet we're always trying to have that support to be really holistic to, mm. to support whatever that person's needs are um and yeah just do what we can yeah during covid it's been a little little bit more difficult there's been lots of new policies lots of new procedures lots of new guidelines um and we've, we've been very very strict actually um about volunteering and supporting partners with um, you know PPA our volunteers um, getting tested um, the amount of times they're able to support some a person in a week um, so there's been been a lot of guidelines and, and policies and procedures around COVID just to keep everybody as safe as possible our volunteers um, as much as our our partners. Mm. Yeah that's what I was thinking of if, if, if you've got like one volunteer with a partner um, in a sense, um, how do you protect the, uh, say, you, you're as much of a volunteer in, in situations like that from something yeah. happening? I mean, we, we, we was lucky enough um, that we received lots of PPAs. We got masks and hand sanitizers. We even bought um, our drivers those shields that you can put in your cars just to sort of oh, shield right. everything. So the driver would sit at the front, the passenger would sit at the back. Yeah. Um, so we just tried to, you know, eliminate risk as much as possible um but still be able to help people when they needed it yeah how much do the shields cost um they was about 30 pound each they're what just you... the yeah there was like nylon one like plastic ones that you could put on with velcro yeah mm, but just as like an added level of protection really yeah 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 and that could be mm, food for thought certainly mm. I um, had another question. Um, when you, your volunteers go out, are they always accompanied by another volunteer or do the volunteer like for health and safety, that sort of thing? Or Yeah, most of our volunteers are what we call lone working in the community. Um, so they would be supporting the partner out in the community by themselves. Um, and it's something who cares are quite, quite hot on in that all of our visits are pre-booked. So we'll always know where our volunteers are and who they're supporting. Um, and once they finish that visit, be that a befriending visit or be that a transport visit, they call into the office to let us know that they're safe and the partner's safe. Um, so yeah, it's something that we're quite, quite hot on. If, if a volunteer is, is lone working in the community, we, we, we need to know that they're safe at the end of the day. Okay, so you don't need two volunteers, Paul? No, generally we don't need two volunteers. But, um, Okay, thank you. I've got a I've got a question. Sorry if I've already if I might have missed it because I've just been checking on my nan. So I'm like, um, for a couple of the people, uh, well, one one person in particular that I've been doing shopping for, which uh, Sheila and Kate know about, they have asked for other help in the house. So I'm wondering if that's something that the volunteers that with that you have can do or that as ma it can be done or there's a way around it um for instance the gentleman older gentleman you know he's in his 90s said his curtain rail fell down and he wanted to have his curtain rail put back up uh, so just to see like for your thoughts how you would handle it yeah i uh, see generally we would say um volunteers wouldn't do tasks in the house um, yeah. especially anything that would would perhaps be considered a health and safety issue yeah um so if there was a need we would look at it but we'd obviously have to look at the the health and safety side of it as well um some of our volunteers do help in the house but they're always sort of pre-agreed with the volunteer before um we've got one volunteer that would 
go once a week just to help um, a lady prepare vegetables. Um, not actually cook a meal, but just actually prepare all her vegetables for the week so that she could cook um, during the week. But that was always sort of pre-arranged. We wouldn't ask our volunteers to sort of go into a house and, 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 and do tasks that they're not happy to do. Yeah. Sure. But yeah, we, we would look at um, if someone has a need. Generally, if there's something to do in the house, um, it is something the staff usually do. Or we find um, a handyman to do it. Right. right. It's, um, yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, I think I think once we start knowing that that COVID's definitely behind us, I think everyone's still a bit nervous about about whether it's going to come back or not. But at the moment, you know, if it's if the thing's looking good, it's going to be something we need to consider for the next step as to. Obviously, when we first started, our health and safety was you cannot go into other people's homes. You cannot be on your own in a vehicle, all of, all of the, the whole list of um, safeguarding measures. But obviously, that will all have to be re-evaluated. We're, we're not back in people's homes just yet. No. Uh, we're still just doing doorstep visits, garden visits, walking visits. Mm. Uh, yeah, that might change from the 17th of May, but just have to look at it again touching wood <laughs> i think i think you probably all agree this last year we've all just had to change and adapt haven't we um it seems like mm. week to week really mm. definitely does anyone else have any questions for michelle oh marilyn you're on silent there you go where's she gone um, I, I, I don't have a question, but I'm um, oh, sorry, I've gone <laughs> disappeared. You can hear me, but you can't see me. Um, but I live on the Who Peninsula and I'm actually a volunteer uh, for Who Cares. And it's been a, a very positive um, experience. And I, I wish it could be across Medway, I have to say. Uh, and I think there's sort of lots for other voluntary organisations to to learn from who care obviously they've had the funding um but it's kind of yeah keep an eye on who care and um take advice from michelle i think it's uh, very worthwhile when when we started Marilyn, we we received so much help from other organizations yeah. um yeah. and we've always said if there's new organizations starting in medway we'd be more than happy to provide the same mm -hmm. um you know advice and help that that we were given when we started so yeah, that, yeah that really comes over michelle and i'm sure it's appreciated so definitely set the bar very high michelle very high well, it wasn't me i wasn't there at the beginning i've only been there four years <laughs> oh no don't 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 tell you on that <laughs> <laughs> well thank you very much for doing a presentation this evening um if anyone has any questions they think of afterwards if you just let me know and i can pass them on um, and with that, I believe we're going over to Paramshot now. Hi everyone, I will try to be quick. Let me just share my screen. Okay, so Sahara is um, it's a word that in Hindi and Punjabi means support or help. Um, and Sahara is a support service for older South Asian people and their carers. Um, so I just want to talk about why it's important to target South Asian groups, communities uh, in particular. So BAME people, that's the general term for Black, Asian and minority ethnic people, um, experience things called health and social inequalities. And these are things that come together and generally like make for a lower quality of life for people in those communities. Um, so we know that BAME people have uh, lower life expectancies and an even lower disability free life expectancy than their white counterparts in England and Wales. So on average, we die uh, sometimes almost 10 years earlier than our white counterparts. And the life that we do have left, most of it, more of it rather, will include various health conditions. Um, and we've seen the health inequalities play out during COVID as well. 
So 50%, we're 50% more likely to die from COVID, generally speaking, on under the BAME umbrella than our white counterparts. Um, so those are some pretty staggering statistics. Uh, that's sort of one reason. Second thing I want to talk about is loneliness. Obviously, it's not something that just impacts older people or South Asian people. Um, and we know that loneliness has massive implications on mental health and physical health. Um, it's associated with developing coronary heart disease and stroke, high blood pressure, uh, developing dementia. It's predictive of suicide in older people. Um, and if we put in things into perspective for what loneliness is like for older people, over one million older people say that they always or often feel lonely. And half of all older people in the UK say that the TV is their main form of company. So as I said, we focus on um, older people, um, particularly South Asian older people. So people that may be experiencing more loneliness because um, you know, there are so many great services out there for older people, but when you factor in things like language barriers and um, sort of cultural stigmas, things like that, it makes it even harder for South Asian people to access those services. And also dementia, again, is something that affects so many people. Um, in the UK, there are 850,000 people with dementia. That's set to rise to 1.6 million by 2040. And um, around 25,000 of those people are from the BAME communities. That's expected to double by 2026 with the steepest increase expected in South Asian communities. So basically, it's, um, it's really relevant to all of us, but being from um, an Indian background and having been a carer for my grandmother who had Alzheimer's, I'm very aware that we don't, we don't know what dementia is and most of us aren't uh, willing to learn about it either. So there's some big gaps in knowledge, in information, and it has a massive impact on the quality of life of uh, the people that suffer from dementia and their carers as well, who suffer along with them. So what's Sahara all about? Basically taking all those things into account, it tries to bridge that gap. Um, it tries to create more social connectedness and bridge that gap so that people have access to the knowledge, information and services that are already out there. So one thing that we do is befriending. I say we do, it's, it's started and it's, it's very difficult to get it off the ground. Um, but we have about three or four befrienders now. Um, so it's telephone befriending, it's befriending in the languages that are native to the people that need befrienders. Um, so at the moment, I've got one Urdu speaker, which is amazing. I've got uh, some Punjabi speakers and one Hin Hindi speaker. So great, need more. We started yoga classes. Uh, it's yoga in Punjabi at the moment that goes on every fortnight on Zoom. And I wanna take these to um, in-person classes too, but I just need to find a yoga teacher that speaks a language that's appropriate which is really difficult. Social activities, something I wanted to do before COVID, but wasn't able to do that now restrictions are easing. We'll have some meetups. Um, Age UK have kindly offered us their venue. So um, it's just about planning it, promoting it and getting enough engagement so that people, you know, there's nothing like this out there for South Asian people and there hasn't been for years. So how are we gonna build that trust with those people and engage them, get them to come out of their houses and join us? How are we gonna make it worthwhile for them? That's gonna be a big thing. Information and advice. Like I said, it's about bridging that gap, letting people know about the resources that are out there, about you know care, need, care, care as assessments, care needs assessments, home adaptations, 
um, free bus passes, blue badges. There's just so many things. Um, it's about being that support. And over the last few months when it's really taken off, we've also done things like um, providing meals to um, people that don't have them, hospital appointments, opticians appointments, things like that. So a little bit of everything. It's just about being that advocate for that person, a friend for that person. Um, and like I'm sure you all know with the great services that you've already spoken about, it's just trying to be there for people. So that's what Sahara is. Volunteers are needed in every, every capacity, every kind of way. Um, you know, I need befrienders, a lot of befrienders um, that speak Punjabi, Hindi, Urdu, and also there are so many other South Asian languages that it, it feels like, how am I ever going to get there? But yes, that. Um, and also just volunteers to do help with other things as well. Um, all the social media promotion, everything, I do all that and planning the events and managing the volunteers and sorting out the training. We don't have any funding. Uh, we need to register as a charity or something before being able to apply. And yes, um, there are many milestones ahead <laughs> and I'm just trying my best um, because I work full time as well. So yeah, that's it. If you have any questions, please let me know. There we are. That was brilliant, Paramshot. Thank you. Thanks. How, how many people in Medway um, fit into, I hate using umbrella, but the, um, the umbrella of Sahara? How many people do you think are potential used service users? Yeah, so to engage people, first of all, I did a massive mail out. I managed to get some information. I did a massive mail out to five to six hundred people. Um, not all of those were older people, but I would say at least maybe a couple of hundred would be able to use the service. Uh, however, I've experienced there are quite a lot of barriers to getting people to... Uh, to use it I mean it's generally you know nobody wants to wants to feel like they're lonely or ask for help or mm. you know there are so many barriers out there um, but as time goes on more and more people are coming out of the woodwork excellent I think once they hear about the services and they hear maybe a few family friends that have been using them Mm. I mean, old people in general, regardless of their cultural upbringing, they're always a little bit sceptical of asking for help in any form. So yeah. it's always going to be a challenge. Yeah, that's very true. And also, if you have a look at like the way that things have been, culturally speaking, throughout generations, we would have normally lived in larger families uh, with, you know, generations living together. But that's something that's changing now. And I've noticed that people that are living alone or people that feel like they've been abandoned by their families, they don't live with their sons, etc., they feel very ashamed about it. And they feel very ashamed to ask for help. So I've, you know, I help someone that doesn't want me to tell anybody who she is because she feels like people know her and she doesn't want them to know <clears throat> that she needs support. So, um, yeah, it's a big cultural thing as well. Yeah, I was, I was thinking when, when you were saying that, I mean, I suppose it's like the urban myth that we're always given is that South Asian families still have that, what we had several mm -hmm. hundred years ago, that tradition of the family. But as you say, it's sort of, it, it is now changing significantly, you would say. Yeah, I think it's changing. In my experience, it definitely is. Mm. So... Yeah, I mean, my grandmother, most of this um, sort of passion comes from my own um, experience of her living with us, um, which was actually her daughter's family, which made her very depressed because her sons didn't want to take care of her. You know, not a big deal on the outside, potentially, but to her, it was sort of life or death, very, very shameful. Mm. Um, and it's not just her. 
it's not just her um you know more and more people generally we you know we're going to have more older people as as life goes on um and more of them will be living alone as well so it's something that we can expect to see a general yeah. shift towards people living alone as kate was saying i mean everyone it's human psychology psychological sort of like re, try and retain your independence and and not you know feel you need to ask for help and as you say there's that pride element as well so but yeah, as pride, Kate was saying, pride, you know if you, if you get a few then then it will be like a snowball and you'll have more attracting but i guess like kate and and also michelle and that could be helpful in in trying to guide you towards applying for grants would, would i be right in that Oh, definitely. Yes, thank you. Thank you. I think I need to take some time off work just to focus on that particular thing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I want to ask, um, using the A Concern UK building, the offices, will that help them, some of them, to go there and not sort of like a neutral environment without feeling, you know, that sense of... Uh, as people know why why they're going there it's like a place that people generally go of the elderly community do you think that yeah, might I, yeah I hope so I hope so I'm kind of a bit nervous because I think that even having it at age UK might raise some <laughs> um concerns for people that you know we need elderly support services <laughs> but you know these are just things that some people will have to come to terms with because <laughs> mm. um you know it's a great space i have a kitchen and everything so anyone else have any questions for parham shop no no is there any other questions that have, that have come up while Everyone's been talking that you've thought about that you might want to ask somebody else. No? Uh, so have a good evening, everyone. But thank you all for joining us on a Friday night.